Snake in the Grass, A Wolf at the Door by Black K Cat. Chapter 5. Apparently, Kakashi's presence acts as some sort of beacon calling all children to Orochimaru. He ends up sleeping with Kakashi on one side, tucked between himself and Sagamo, and Tsunade's apprentice on the other while Tsunade takes first watch. Orochimaru finds that he doesn't mind nearly as much as he once would have. Shisune is very mature, despite being barely 10 years old, and she has a ruthless streak to her that Orochimaru can appreciate. She also has a rather charming penchant for poisons, and once she had learned that Orochimaru's family is infamous for them, she detached herself to his side and started asking questions. He had answered, and not solely because Tsunade would have hit him if he'd brushed the girl off. Not solely because Sagamo would have given him wounded, disappointed eyes for a rude dismissal. Amuchimaru is familiar with their reactions to his less than stellar interpersonal skills by now, and Sagamo has been helping. Kakashi has been helping with his mere presence. Apparently, it's very difficult to find a Bujimaru as terrifying as usual when Kakashi is weaving his hair into knots and leaving food smears all across his robes. People in the village are better, not so quick to turn their eyes away and hurry past now. It's still not a home, not a place a Bujimaru would choose to stay over any other if forced to pick. He stays for Sakamo, for Kakashi, for Sarutobi, for his parents' graves. For the duty that's been drilled into his head is that he could walk. But this change is enough to make it safe, perhaps. Homey, if not yet a home. Now, perhaps, he will have the chance to stay for Tsunade as well. Sleep isn't coming, isn't even a possibility at the moment, so with a faint sigh, Orochimaru slides out of his bedroll and rises to his feet, careful to keep his movements silent. Sakamo shifts faintly, but doesn't otherwise stir, and the two children are dead to the world. So Orochimaru picks his way past them and heads to where his former teammate is sitting just outside the circle of firelight, leaning back against a tree. Tsunade looks tired when Orochimaru can see of her face in the moonless night. Weary and worn and so incredibly deeply sad that it makes his stomach twist as he settles himself beside her. If you wanted, he says, barely even a murmur, you could leave now, and I will make Sakamo release you from your bed. She looks at him, surprise and then sweet fondness crossing her face in swift succession, and reaches out to gently touch his cheek. Thank you, Richimaro, she says quietly, but I think I can't let you do that. This is... Something I need, and something I'll never do on my own. Not if I'm given a choice. It hurts, aches deep down inside of him to know that she wouldn't return without coercion. Wouldn't come back to Kanaha for him or Jiraiya or Sarutobi. But Orochimaru can force himself to be understanding, even if he doesn't quite comprehend it himself. He knew Dan as well. Liked him and approved of the way he so clearly adored Tsunade. Orochimaru was there when the team returned to the village, saw the way Tsunade had fractured into countless pieces with the loss of the man she loved. He was the one she clung to that first night with that Dan, the one she cried her heart out in front of, but... But Orochimaru is a selfish creature. He doesn't want to understand why she left him when he had suffered a similar loss as a child, when he was willing to support her, even if he wasn't quite sure how. If he could bring the dead back to life, he would have. For Tsunade, he would break the loss of reincarnation, would resurrect anyone he could to make sure she never cried again. Whatever the sacrifice, he would make it, because he doesn't know any other way to help. But he has no way to put that into words, so he doesn't. No way to say what he means and have it to come out correctly in a form that won't push Tsunade even further away, so he keeps his peace and simply nods. Tsunade looks at him like she knows what he's thinking anyway, fond and a little sad, and leans in to kiss him gently on the forehead. Her strong fingers curl around his arm, holding tightly, and Orochimaru leans into the touch. She's never shied away from him, or thought of him as anything beyond a little brother to endure and protect in equal measure, and so Orochimaru shows his acceptance of her emotions by accepting her gestures. It's always worked before, and he hopes she still understands just what it means that it doesn't push her away. I'm sorry I couldn't stay, she whispers against his hair. It was all too much. I'm like a curse, Orochi. I wished them both good luck, and they both died. In the village, it was the source of all their dreams, all their hopes. I couldn't stay there, not with so many memories, all so fresh and painful. 
Not when I failed to save both of them. I was the one who failed to save Nowaki. Orochimaru manages to get out past the obstruction in his throat. He reaches out to touch the thin cord hanging around Tsunade's neck, the necklace he managed to bring back to her when the mission became a deadly rush to retreat. He was under my command. As a squad leader, it was my... It wasn't. Tsunade cuts him off, but her voice is still gentle, still kind. Her fingers close over his and hold them in place. That was... It wasn't your fault. Then it wasn't yours either. Orochimaru insists, because that's simple logic. I was present and had responsibility. If you don't hold me accountable, you can't hold yourself. That would be... Stupid. But she's smiling even though her eyes are wet. Orochimaru rolls his eyes a little. Illogical. He corrects. Tsunade laughs a little, and it's a victory. Hard won and dear. You and your logic, Orochi. She murmurs, brushing a lock of hair back behind his ear. All right. Nawaki, I can accept that I couldn't have done anything to save him, as I was then. If I had argued for a medic sooner, or if my curse... Orochimaru hisses angrily before he can stop himself, even though this is progress, even though this is a step forward, because he's furious! Furious that Tsunade, who has always been so strong and sure and certain, has been reduced to this, to a superstitious and broken woman! There is no curse, he insists, pulling back enough to meet her startled gaze. There is coincidence, and there is a shinobi's life, and there is death. You are not cursed, Tsunade, not unless I am as well. Was the death of my parents my fault? Because I wished them luck before their mission? Would you hold me accountable? Of course not! Then why do you keep clinging to this? Why can you not see that it was a war? So many people died, Tsunade, because that's what happens. That's what being a shinobi means. If you want to break this curse, he spits the word out, disgusted with it, with his inability to say this in a way that she can understand. Then end wars. Become Hokage and keep us from having to fight again. You are smart, Tsunade. So clever. A genius. But even you cannot control fate, no matter what you seem to think. Orochimaru rises to his feet, trying to pull his fury back beneath his skin before he wakes the others and nudges Tsunade's attempt to grab his arm. He's in no fit frame of mind to interact with other people right now. Won't stay and risk saying something that can drive Tsunade away for good, because he does love her. She's one of the few he can say with absolute certainty that he loves. But right now, he can't quite bring himself to look at her. He stalks away from the faint light of the campfire into the darkest part of the shadows and doesn't allow himself to glance back until he can no longer hear any signs of his companion's presence. Only then does he force his feet to stop and leans up against the rough bark of an old oak to try recovering his equilibrium. He shouldn't have shouted at her. No matter how bad he is with people, he can recognize that much. Tsunade is grieving, even three years after Dan's death. Maybe she always will be. But that's no reason to get aggravated, to yell. Orochimaru never yells, but this... This is abandonment. This is looking at the woman who was always his lodestone, his conscience, the woman whose words and guidance have been his model for interaction since they met, and facing the fact that she abandoned him. She left. Even though Jiraiya was already gone, and Sarutobi no longer had time for them, and... And Sakamo found him then. Sakamo dragged him out of the shadows he'd been staring in since her departure and made him face the light. Made him face his own inadequacies and failings, and then move on from them. Sakamo, who doesn't mind when Orochimaru gets distracted by his research, but comes to drag him out of his lab and make him eat. Who smiles at the sight of him, who trusts him with Kakashi, his son, the last surviving member of his clan. Who pokes and prods and teases and pushes him beyond what's comfortable, pushes him to be more. If Tsunade hadn't left, Orochimaru might never have met Sakamo. And he's self-aware enough to know that he would be lesser for it. It is possible that he owes Tsunade an apology. Would he have recognized that before Sakamo? And even if he had, he certainly wouldn't plan on acting on it the way he now knows he must. And 
A shift in the air, Asada plays the barest hint of killing intent, tightly leashed, and Orochimaru spins away from the shelter of the tree, drawing Kusanagi automatically. A kunai clangs off the flat of the blade, spinning away into the shadows at the same time as the earth shakes beneath him, and Orochimaru leaps up and out of the grasping hands rising from the earth. There's another attacker in the branches above him, Shuriken already raining down, and Orochimaru whirls to block even as he feeds Chakra into his summoning tattoo. One glancing touch to the ground before him throws himself at the shinobi emerging from the earth, and a low, furious hiss tells him that it works. Kiyohime darts past him, black scales all but invisible in the darkness, and Orochimaru changes direction in a smooth shift, bounding up into the branches and hissing at a winjutsu. Two men scream in unison, one shredded by blades of air, and the other at the mercy of of Kiyohime's poison, but there's no time to gloat. Orochimaru leaps down, dodging a burst of fire that nearly singes the ends of his hair and flips over a sword that tries to take off his head. The man wielding it dies quickly, losing his own head to Kusanagi's impossibly sharp edge, and Orochimaru lands lightly and turns, seeking the last of the chakra signatures he can pain sharp and suddenly enough to make him cry out as a chokotam steps into him from behind. It makes him stagger even as the sound of scales sliding over leaf litter signals Kiyohime's approach. The man swears, whirling around, and Orochimaru tries to follow through to take advantage, but his head is spinning more than it should from blood loss alone. Poison, he thinks, and then Janjutsu, and can't tell which it is. But he is a shinobi and has been for as long as he has memory. He has fought through wars where the field is choked with the smell of burning flesh, through battles where the air itself is poison, through blood loss and exhaustion and rivers of blood. And this is a flesh wound and nothing more. He grits his teeth, turns his stagger into a twisting lunge, and leaves the man who wounded him to Kiyohime's tender mercies as he takes the last remaining nin. The stranger curses, falling back. But Orochimaru herds enough to be reckless and follows, striking low and fast. Another curse, and the man tries for a fire jutsu that lights up the night. He's good at them, too good to have it be anything but an affinity, and that points to a fire country native. Donzo, Orochimaru thinks with fury, remembering a fatherly hand on his shoulder before his real father's grave. Remembering the loathing, the anger, the sudden surge of comprehension when the man said, We look out for our own Orochimaru. If you accept, we can find this traitor and bring them down. What else? Who else could it be, given all the clues he has? Donzo is a Kanaha shinobi, but what other answer could Orochimaru possibly come to? And these shinobi now who were approaching their camp. Orochimaru feels his blood ice over in his veins at the thought, because for all that they set out a guard, they had not expected an attack. Not when two members of the Sanin and Kanaha's white fang were present. But what if these men had come upon a sleeping camp, caught them unaware? Would they have killed him? Killed Sakamo to drive Orochimaru right to Donzo? Killed Kakashi, a child who can barely walk, let alone defend himself? The snarl of pure fury that ranges from his throat is enough to startle even Orochimaru, but he doesn't let it. The other man falters, steps back as the fire fades, and Orochimaru lunges right through the remaining flame, ignoring the scorching, searing bite of bird's skin as he drives Kusanagi forward. The man twists away, but the straight thrust is a feint, and as the man moves past him, Orochimaru turns hand stiffened into a blade and strikes the back of his neck hard enough to knock him unconscious for a very long while. A flicker of chakra signals a shunshin somewhere nearby, and Orochimaru spins, blade rising to intercept whatever attack might come. But the movement makes his head spin worse than ever, sends him staggering back in an attempt to get his feet under him, and he catches a single blurred glimpse of silver hair and wide gray eyes before everything goes black. Tsunade's hands are shaking, and her face is pale. She had wavered at the sight of so much blood, wavered and nearly collapsed, but then Orochimaru had fallen, a breath stuttering in his lungs. She had moved, then hurried to his side with her hands already glowing green, and Sagamo respects her for it. Admires her, even, because from what Orochimaru said, her fear of blood was a phobia, debilitating and severe, as she overcame it for Orochimaru's sake. She saved him, and Sakamo will never cease to be grateful for that. Sakamo's own hands are shaking slightly as he clutches Kakashi to him, the little boy wide-eyed and silent. He holds his son tightly, buries his nose in wild silver hair because he can't touch Orochimaru right now. Can't let Kakashi go to the other man, even though Kakashi begged earlier because Tsunade is still working Shizune at her side. The burns are dangerous even more so than the stab wound, with the poison most dangerous of all. And even though Orochimaru is stable now, he wasn't ten minutes ago. 
But Tsunade's features are set in grim, stubborn lines, unwavering and immovable, and she hasn't looked up from her patient yet. She's muttering under her breath a constant stream of evectives and pleas, curses, and begging in equal measure. Orochimaru's body is healing itself, but slowly, and the best Tsunade can do is help it along. They don't have the equipment to do anything more complicated than that, and there's no way to move Orochimaru safely. The only one who knew that they were planning to leave was the Hokage. The Hokage and whatever Anbu happened to be in the room when Orochimaru told him of his intention to find Tsunade. Takuma's free hand tightens into a fist and he wants more than anything to pound Shimura Danzo's face into paste. He won't even waste any shinobi techniques on it. A good old-fashioned brawl is just about all that could sweeten his mood right now. Tsunade sits back on her heels with a short sigh, wiping the back of her hand over her forehead and leaving a short streak of blood there. Her eyes are still on her former teammate, heavy and grim, but not as much as they were when she started. Sakamo takes that as a good sign. You said that you want me to stay until whoever's targeting Orochimaru has been taken care of, she says without raising her head. Eyes narrowing, Sakamo wonders if she's about to go back on their bed, if she's giving up, getting ready to run. That's right, he answers evenly, even though all of his muscles feel strung taut. It's then that Tsunade raises her head, and when she meets his gaze, her eyes are burning, blazing with something Sagamo has never seen in her before. Regret, he thinks. Determination, relief, fury, protectiveness. All of them wrapped up and twisted together into a blade of white hot resolve. That implies you already know who's doing this, but can't prove anything yet. Who is it? There's no debate whether to tell her. Sagamo lets his eyes drift back to the still, pale figure lying supine between them. We don't have any proof, he agrees. But before we left, Donzo approached Orochimaru and offered to uncover the traitor. If Orochimaru joined his fruit division, it's... Too convenient. Tsunade finishes mouth twisting. She sighs and puts her hand on Shizune's shoulder. Get some sleep, okay? You were a brilliant help today. Shizune is awake enough to give a small thankful smile, but only just. She staggers over to her bedroll and crawls under the blanket, then is asleep within moments. Kakashi is nodding off too, though he clearly doesn't want to, and Takamo shifts his grip on the boy, keeping his voice carefully modulated as he says. Exactly, and Orochimaru was not good after they met. Rattled, almost, and I've seen him a lot of ways, but never like that before. Coiled tightly next to Sakamo's knee, Orochimaru's black summons, a good four meters long at least and as vicious as her master, finally raises her head. Sagamo has met her before while working and on one memorable occasion when Orochimaru was called away on an emergency mission while watching Kakashi. And Sagamo had come home to find a vast black snake curled up in his son's crib. She's quiet but observant, utterly devoted to Orochimaru. And when she murmurs, the boneyard. Sagamo pays attention. Pardon? He asks, because like his wolves, she frames things in terms her own kind will understand. Eerily blue eyes, an impossibly vivid color that shouldn't be found anywhere in nature, stare back at him, utterly unimpressed by his lack of comprehension. The boneyard. She repeats, her voice a whispery rasp edged with something sharp. Where you lay the bones of those who fall, the man approached Orochimaru-sama there. Tsunade makes a sound somewhere between a growl and a snarl. If that's true, if that bastard waited until Orochimaru went to visit his parents' graze to talk to him... She clenches one hand, and Sakamo vividly remembers tales of the sand and Tsunade's physical strength. He winces. Not that he has sympathy for Donzo, but the collateral damage will likely be impressive. I left one of them alive. A quiet but steady voice cuts in, and Sakamo jerks his gaze down to see golden eyes regarding him, fogged with pain and anesthetic, but still sharp. Did you find him? Sagamo swallows, reaching out to pick up Orochimaru's hand and carefully curl his own around the slim, pale fingers. I did, he assures the other man, dredging up his best smile. It is a pale, poor effort, but hopefully Orochimaru is too out of it to notice. He's dressed up and under four different seals to keep him unconscious. 
I'm sure the Hokage will be more than happy to pass them over to T and I when we get back. Orochimaru makes a vague sound of agreement, eyes already fluttering shut again. I think he's fire country. He murmurs. Fire affinity. Least common in other countries, and he was trained in Keton styles. Too good at using them to be otherwise. It takes effort for Zagamo not to roll his eyes. Of course, Orochimaru would notice such a thing, fighting in the dark while severely outnumbered, poisoned, and bleeding out from a stab wound that only just missed exceedingly vital areas. Judging by the way she's shaking her head, Tsunade feels the same way. Sleep, she orders him, gently laying a hand over his eyes. We're only a few hours from the village. Even if you rest until morning, we'll make good time back. Patrol. Orochimaru murmurs, even as his breathing evens out into sleep. When Tsunade lifts her hand, his face is peaceful, if still slightly pinched with pain. Tsunade looks at him for a long moment, then sighs fondly and shakes her head again. We don't have enough people to patrol and keep watch, she says. Paranoid bastard? But the word has sparked something, and Sagamo blinks, realization setting on. Not us, he corrects with a soft laugh. He means that there was a patrol headed this way. He's been helping organize the schedules, and if I remember them correctly, they should reach us a little after dawn. I think the leader is even fond of lovely hair, if it's who I think it is. Tsunade gives him an assessing look he can't understand, but simply nods instead of speaking whatever's on her mind. Good, is all she says. I don't want Orochimaru walking any more than he absolutely has to, and if I have to tie him to a stretcher to make sure of it, I'm more than happy to do so. She reaches out, gently stroking some blood matted hair away from Orochimaru's face and sighs softly. You're such a moron, she murmurs, quietly enough that Sakuma only hears it because his eyes are better than normal. I was just fine wallowing, but then you had to march in and overturn everything. I can't even fall back on my fear of blood anymore when I'm looking for reasons to be a coward. The only option you've left me is facing everything I'm ashamed of. Everything that scares me. It's a private thought, so Sakumo doesn't answer it, but he wants to. He wants to shake her, ask why she didn't come back before even when Orochimaru was so clearly in need of her. But it's not his place, not his to say, no matter how much he wants to berate her for it. She's coming back. She's already saved Orochimaru once, and that's enough. That's so much more than just enough. Oh! Kakashi says suddenly, reaching out again, and this time he wriggles out of Sakamo's hold before his father can get a better grip. Three startlingly steady steps bring the toddler right up to Orochimaru's side, and Kakashi drops down to sit in the curve of his elbow created by Sakamo's grip on the snake's and its outstretched arm. Kakashi pauses, regarding Orochimaru solemnly, and then he fists his hands in Orochimaru's long hair and curls up right next to him, clearly unwilling to be moved. Sagamo looks at Tsunade, and Tsunade looks back at him, both of them fighting smiles. With a chuckle, Sagamo reaches out to stroke Kakashi's flyaway hair, then over to Mars, and settles back. You should sleep as well, he informs Tsunade kindly. That was a lot of healing in a short amount of time. I'll keep watch. For a moment, Tsunade looks ready to argue, but a yawn takes her by surprise. And in the end, she just nods her tired thanks. Wake me if anything changes, she orders, then rises stiffly to her feet and heads for her bedroll, stretching as she goes. I am a lady, Sakamo chuckles, but she doesn't seem to hear him, already settling next to her apprentice. He turns his eyes to Urujimaru instead, thinking of the scene they came upon just a few hours before. Blood and fire, corpses carved by sword stroke or wind blades or huge snake's venom, with Orochimaru standing in the middle of it all, drenched with blood, both his own and not, a vicious sort of coldness on his face, and the skin on his cheek, shoulder, and arms, scorched and blistered. Sakamo has never forgotten just what Orochimaru is, a shinobi down to the very heart of him, calculating and fond of bloodshed and beyond skilled at killing. But... Sometimes it's hard to remember when he's scolding Kakashi for chewing on his hair or watching Sagamo with a light in those strange golden eyes. Times like those, Sagamo looks at him and wonders how anyone in their right mind could be scared of this beautiful, absent-minded, fiercely loyal man. 
and then he sees him painted in blood, standing over the bodies of his enemies like some forgotten god of wrath, and it's too easy to see why. Humans fear what they can't understand, and Orochimaru is everything the human mind doesn't want to comprehend. He's the darkness within them all, the phantom of what they could become if no little voice whispered, Stop! in the back of their thoughts. He is the animalistic killer controlled by an all-too-human brain and all the crueler for it. He is malice and violence with forethought and the icy edge of a blade against their throat, and they shy away from it. Anyone would. For years, that has been the only side of Orochimaru they were allowed to see, no matter what he showed his teammates or his teacher. It took Sakamo and Kakashi to make it more obvious, to bring those hidden facets to light, and he will never, ever regret doing so. Orochimaru is his best friend, his anchor, and Sakamo is aware enough to see that he is the same for Orochimaru. He has feared that would change with Tsunade's return, but he's beginning to see that it won't. Tsunade is broken in ways only she herself can begin to fix, and until she does, she cannot be the strength that Rojimaru needs. But Sakamo can. He has been for the past year, and he's hardly about to let that change now. It is as necessary as breathing for him to be needed, and Rojimaru needs him. Kakashi needs him, and that's enough to keep him strong. He won't falter again, not with such things clear in his mind. The sound of soft voices and the feeling of motion pulls Orochimaru up from the depths of sleep, and he opens his eyes to the sight of green branches above him, patches of blue sky, and morning sun showing through. He's lying on a rough stretcher, carried between two shinobi he recognizes from missions, and there's a small woman with long brown hair walking beside him, pale violet eyes sweeping their surroundings every few seconds. Sir, she says politely, how are you feeling? Should I kiss you now, Rizama? Here we go. He answers and closes his eyes again, assessing his body. There's a feigned ache down his left side and an odd sort of absence of feeling in his right that speaks of pain just waiting for him to move. I'm fine. The attackers. Hyuga Himawari looks down at him then, and he can't quite read her expression. We retrieve the bodies and have the survivor in custody. From the brief study I did, they all appear to bear the same seal on their tongues. For silence, I believe. It might hinder our investigation. That makes Orochimaru blink, and then Archer Brow at her. It probably has less effect than normal when he can hardly raise his head. Investigation, he echoes, faintly bemused. The Yuga lifts her chin. She's older than him by several years, a member of the main house, and quite good with her family's nojutsu, but he knows little else. Of course, she affirms, as though it's offensive to think of doing anything else. Forgive me, sir, but three times now I've seen you nearly killed under suspicious circumstances. This time, I think it best to go directly to the Haukage with my concerns, as approaching the Internal Investigations Division did nothing. Orochimaru hadn't realized she had gone even that far. He is uncertain as to the correct response in this situation and simply nods, offering, You have my thanks. She tilts her chin in acknowledgement, murmurs, Excuse me, sir. We're coming up on the gates. As the patrol comes to a halt and leaps lightly ahead to be the gate guards, a good head on her shoulders, that one, Sakamo says cheerfully as he slides into her previous spot. Kakashi is asleep in his sling, a wet spot forming on Sakamo's shirt under his mouth. Orochimaru is simply grateful that for once it isn't his hair getting rolled on. He makes a soft noise of absent agreement, then tilts his head to spot Tsunade, walking beside Shizune and speaking softly to her apprentice. She doesn't catch him looking, and Orochimaru turns away before she can feel his gaze and descend on him like the mother, and she pretends not to be. He's tired, though, which is the best indication that he's hurt himself badly enough to have nearly exhausted his chakra, and sleep is already pulling at him again. Hospital, he asks, just barely managing to get the word out clearly. No! Sagamo answers gently, and calloused fingers skim through his hair. Tsunade says all you need now is rest, and to rebuild your reserves. Knowing you, you'll rest better somewhere comfortable. I could take you to your house, if that's what you want. A hesitation, careful, and cautious. And then Sagamo adds with the shadow of his usual chair. Or mine, of course. I'm sure Kakashi would love to play nursemaid for you, lovely. Arajimaro thinks of his quiet, lonely house his mother's books, and his father's weapons still on the walls. And he can't bear the thought of it. Not now. Not yet. Just as he opens his mouth to say so, a cry gets him off. 
so naughty! He forces his eyes open just in time to see a large shape come bounding past his stretcher right up towards where Sonata is standing. Several steps away, Jiraiya slows, then halts. And from this angle, Orochimaru can see him staring at her expression twisted up somewhere between longing and sorrow and relief. His breath catches in his throat because no matter how much time has passed, that's how he has always, always wanted Jiraiya to look at him. And yet... And yet, time and again, just as he did now, Jiraiya passes him by. Before, Tsunade treated Jiraiya's crush like something to be adored or something to ignore. But right now, as she looks back at him, Orochimaru can see the realization settling behind her eyes, the recognition and understanding. She smiles watery and wan and steps forward. Jiraiya, she answers, and then more softly, I missed you, you big idiot. Jiraiya smiles back, so in love, it aches like another stabber just to see, and takes the last step that lies between them, folding Tsunade into his arms for a hug. She curls arms around him in return, pressing her face against his shoulder and closing her eyes, and they're beautiful together. They always have been. It's hard to breathe, Orochimaru thinks, pushing himself up from the stretcher. Or perhaps that's the wound in his side, the burns tracing his skin like brands. Agony stills his sight for a moment, makes his head spin, but he struggles to rise. Regardless, he can't stay here, can't watch the death of all the dreams he already knew were hopeless. He loves them both, he does, and he knows they are far better suited for each other than Jiraiya is for him, but... But Orochimaru is a selfish creature, and that will never change. And catches his elbow, brings him upright with a steadying touch, and that little bit of support is enough to clear the haze from his eyes. He looks up to meet a steady gray gaze, heavy with sympathy and grief, and instead of arguing, Sakamo simply wraps a careful armor at his waist and holds him up. Your house, Orochimaru tells him, through the sandpaper roughness clogging his throat. If the offer stands, I would appreciate it. He wants to say, but a soft murmur reaches his ears, words shared between two old friends, and the phrase dies stillborn in his mouth. Of course, Sagamo murmurs, and a moment later a whirl of leaves whisks them away.